Welcome to Talking Sock. I'm your host, Pete Davidson. In this second episode with shadow puppeteer Richard Bradshaw, we discuss his role in establishing Unimar Australia. And I wrote a very strange constitution, which was our initial constitution, <laughs> hardly legally valid. As well as his work uncovering the history of Australian puppeteers, including creator of Mr Squiggle, Norman Hetherington. Norman was a brilliant cartoonist, there's no doubt of that. Join Richard and I now, here on Talking Sock. Welcome to Talking Sock, your one-stop shop for all things puppetry arts and practitioners. You are back here with Pete Davidson of One Orange Sock Productions and Richard Bradshaw, Australian puppetry legend of Shadow Theatre. We're going to carry on our conversation from our previous episode, which you can catch on last week's post. Richard, you've been a member of the international puppetry organisation Unimar since 1964. Firstly, it was the British Unimar, and you helped to establish Unimar Australia in 1970. Can you tell us how Unimar Australia was formed and who was involved? Well, Edith Murray is the important character here. She had gone to England in 1963, I think, which was when they were celebrating the tercentenary, I think, of Punch. (laughs) So she was in England a year ahead of me and she persuaded me to bring some puppets when I went to England. In those days, when you travelled by ship, you could take as many suitcases as you like. You could Huzzah. take an awful lot of stuff. How many? How long, how long did it take to travel by ship in those it days? Took five weeks. Oh, uh, wow, what a journey. It was a great trip, though. Went to New Zealand, Tahiti, Acapulco, uh, Panama City, uh, through the Panama Canal to Curacao and Trinidad. So it was... It's a world tour. <laughs> it was wonderful. I took some puppets and on the way, she said that we had been invited to present my show shadows at an amateur festival of Unima in um, Czechoslovakia in Kalavivari. Now, before leaving Australia, I had joined the British Unima because she was also planning to go to a festival in Leningrad in mm. June of that year, and so we did. <laughs> so uh, that was my introduction to, to a Unima event. The uh, festival in Kalavivari where I performed, that, that was a festival of amateur puppetry, and then we went back to England and the next month got a ship in the Thames, <laughs> the Baltica, a Russian ship, and went up to Leningrad by sea, calling it Gothenburg and then Helsinki. And this was the very ship that Gorbachev and Reagan met on some years no. later. <laughs> yes, the Baltic. Wow. This was a festival, a Unima festival, but of Soviet puppetry, puppetry from all the Soviets, so Armenia. And, and it was a, an eye-opener because there were some very large companies, brilliant companies, yes. uh, with as many as 20 performers. Uh, so that that was a, a great trip and we were very enthusiastic about Unima. We met... Kawajiri, the Japanese uh, puppeteer from Puk, and met a number of people from different countries and were very enthusiastic about having an Australian Unima. So some years later, um, I think this is getting nearer to 1970, Edith contacted Jan Malik, the General Secretary of Unima at the time, to see how we could form a national centre of Unima. And uh, that was given the go-ahead. And so uh, the original Unima committee was uh, Edith's secretary, Nancy Johnson, who ran a little puppet theatre in West Perth called The Nutshell. Nancy Johnson was the treasurer. Norman Hetherington was the president. And I wow. was the, the fourth member. So the four of us had met together and, and sort of planned this. And I wrote a very strange constitution, which was our initial constitution, <laughs> that hardly legally valid. <laughs> uh, but that that was the beginning. So it's, it's largely Edith's work to get us in, but the, a lot of enthusiasm from us. Others. And then you yourself became president of Unimar Australia from 2004 to 08, and you attended most of the Unimar congresses and festivals since 72. And I think you performed in four of them, so 1972, 76, 88, and 2008. And so you've been to these four congresses and you've seen Unimar as an organisation, but also puppetry, um, you know, a real centre of puppetry changing over the years. Can you tell us a about what that experience of, A, being president was like, but also how puppetry has changed and from your experience? Well, the very big change was the um, the fall of the Berlin Wall, really, the, wow. and, the, and the break-up, because in the old days, 
it was politically quite divided, the uh, Unima. So it had to have a, a certain number from the East, a certain number from the West. Well, I'm talking about political East, political West, and then non-aligned people. So I, see. I think Switzerland and India were non-aligned. And, of course, the, the two Germanys, <laughs> West Germany and East Germany, were on opposite sides. And the big difference was that in the, the West... The companies were generally small, and in the East they were generally large, but there weren't many solo puppeteers. Peter Wyshynski, I think, was an exception, as Abratsov himself was. So there was a big difference which where the festival was, and the festivals had to alternately be in the East and West, and they were nearly always European. And people thought of Unima then as being a U- uh, European organisation. Mm. It was interested in having people from other parts of the world but it was very Eurocentric. Yes. And and still is a bit. I think puppetry but, is very Eurocentric. At the, yeah, it's such yeah. a different world well, over there. So much happens. Yes. Uh, it is, uh, it's a very big industry there. Yes. And and, and supported too by, by government. Yes, uh, funded. Wouldn't that be exactly. wonderful? Exactly. So that's a big change, that, that, that the politics has gone and the... We miss the the large shows from uh, from the east because uh, they can't get the funding quite as they used to. I, I remember when I was uh, in in Poland, a theatre was also doubling as a restaurant because that was the way that was keeping it going. Wow! Uh, they had to find other ways of getting money beyond the uh, the audience money. So it's quite ingenious, uh, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it did work for them. So that's that's one change. Of course, the the puppets are different. They're much larger uh, in many cases because in the old days, puppets were made of heavy materials and would have lasted longer. The polystyrene wasn't around when uh, when I first was a member of Unima. And now we see a lot of giant puppetry, which is a very different theatrical form. So it's the size of puppets. I think perhaps... Some of the operating skill is, is not as obvious now as it was then. I think people are probably more professional. Professional is not the right word. But they'd establish them more of an illusionary. There was a, they, were, they were very skilled operators uh, of puppets. There were changes I would like to see, I suppose. I would like to see more done with live live voices and not recorded sound uh, so that they can respond to the audience. That's just a personal thing. <laughs> mm. And I want to ask a bit more about your journey with Shadow Puppets and how your performance has changed, perhaps from 72 to 08. What happened in your career and in your shows? What it, Has everything really stayed? I can't imagine everything stayed the same. How does your technique change? It certainly has changed. Uh, in I've learned, in fact, not to make the puppets too elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel I would now like to do shows. This hasn't changed. This change hasn't happened. But the audience doesn't see me working the puppets. There's a video of my show which also has glimpses from behind. It's clear that people enjoy very much seeing me working the puppets. And I have a feeling that it would be much better if they could see some of that as well as the show. Now, whether I should do the show with my back towards the audience and have a camera sitting in front of the screen so that they can see what's happening on video, I don't, that could be a way. Uh, Jeff Askham, that's his name, isn't it, from uh, Melbourne, it does a very, very nice show and you see him all the time working and it, it's it's really great to watch him and see how he's doing that, how he's making the shadow sometimes with the hair of his own head sometimes <laughs> that appears. I like that. I think that audiences like to see the way things are done now. Yes. Uh, that's a, that's a the big intrigue. change. intrigue, yes. The cabaret style of puppet, which comes, I suppose, mainly between the wars of World War One and Two, changed what the marionettes did because they used to just appear behind a lot of scenery and people didn't see the puppeteers and weren't allowed backstage to see how the puppets were worked. And now people watch the puppet. Well, they have the puppeteer, but they're watching the puppet. They occasionally look up at the puppeteer if it's a good show. Mm. But, uh, so the puppeteer is almost invisible even when he's visible. He or she. <laughs> and... 
I want to ask about your characters because you create I this silly. Your question. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't really answered your question about how it's changed my technique, uh, and I don't know that I can. But <laughs> um, it's instinctive, maybe. Yeah, I did, there's, there's certainly mechanical things that I uh, that I've learned in the past. The show itself has changed over the years, although there are many items. I was looking at a, a program from way back about 30 years ago and there's still a lot of that show in my present thing. What I have dropped is a long story, The, the Stork Caleb, because I've, I've opted more for the short items, which I think suit shadow puppets. The gags of, yeah. of them, yes. Not necessarily gags, but shorter stories. I'm limited how complicated the story can be, uh, just having two hands and one screen, and so changing scenery is a difficult thing. But for me, shorter items, not this, I, every time I do a new item, I try to make it very different from anything I've done before. Have you worked with a puppeteer in tandem? Have you done a, a two-person show? L- not, not with the Shadow Puppets, no. no. Uh, we did at the Marinette Theatre do Allergy in Wonderland, which was a, a shadow show, uh, which wasn't a great success, in fact. It was uh, a version of Alice in Wonderland, which had been translated into Pigeon Shijara and uh, illustrated with illustrations based on bark paintings of Northern Australia. So it's a bit of a mess to begin with. And we did that following the... Uh, the book fairly closely. In Sydney, we got some not very nice reviews. In Melbourne, they were quite favourable. There is a difference between the two cities. There really <laughs> is, yeah. So I'm going to go back to that question about your characters and the silhouettes that you create because they are beautifully made and there is something about them that is very distinctly your style. How do you approach a character design and how do you approach creating that that very unique quite comic silhouette that is still very much a a reference to whatever character you're trying to create. It's funny this, is because one doesn't instinctively think I'll do it in the design my way. (laughs) It just happens. But one thing I'm very aware of is that the figure has to be seen by someone at the back of an audience. So it's a quite small figure in my show. The screen's quite small, a metre wide. Um, and so the figures are not large, but people at the back of the hall should be able to see what they are. So usually what happens is that I will make a small drawing of the scene with the figures almost like stick figures and just go from that sketch to the larger puppet not adding too much information. So it's a matter of simplifying the line, really, and not making, not putting too much detail in. And it's a real trap. You want to put in detail at times, but the audience won't see it. So. Yes. <laughs> We've spoken earlier in, in the first episode about your approach to comic timing, but I want to ask about your approach to the, the short story and how you actually, do these ideas just pop into your head about little little jokes or little visuals that would work out or have you have, are they come from conversations or where do they, how do they come about? I suppose just an idea drops into, <laughs> into your head. I'm working on a new item at the moment, which is a love story between a giraffe and a hippopotamus, oh. but I won't go into details about that. <laughs> Oh, okay. it, it should be a surprise when it happens. <laughs> they don't have children. <laughs> oh, just checking. Good to know. And uh, outside of your puppetry practice, people may not know that apart from being a puppeteer, you've also been researching the history of puppetry in Australia for quite some time. And you've written chapters of shadow puppets uh, for books in Spain and in Germany, uh, entries on the Australian puppetry history in various books, including the Worldwide Encyclopedia of uh, Puppetry Arts for Unima and the World Encyclopedia of Contemporary Theatre. How important is it for young and emerging puppeteers to know about puppeteering history? I think it's it's pretty important because uh, a lot of the things that were being done in the 19th century are still being done. You know, the, the dissecting skeleton and uh, the, the Grand Turk marionette, there's still people doing these things and they have to see why a show today should be different from those shows, what what has happened that's different. The Darks, for instance, that one of the companies that I've been uh, following, that's D apostrophe A-R-C, like Jean d'Arc, Joan of Arc, it's the same surname, they had to do all the sound themselves. So they had to be loud enough 
to be heard in large theatres, even though they're speaking behind drapes right. that are masking them. They did carry a large bass drum, which they hit with a, a drumstick, obviously, because <laughs> <laughs> uh, they had an item based on the Salvation Army. In the middle of the Carloquinade, at the end of the pantomime, in came the Salvation Army. Oh, it's a great joke. <laughs> Very clever. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, the nice thing is when they were doing it in Cooktown, th- there was a hall that the Salvation Army was going to, had booked and they actually allowed them to do it there, knowing that there was this send-up of the Salvation Army in the show, <laughs> singing a hymn, of course. <laughs> so you, one gets ideas from, from these old things. I'm just interested mainly in, in how they survived and how they travelled. I, these, the Darks, for instance, had left England in 1891, I think, and were still touring in about five or six years later in, in Asia. They were away from home for so long. And these big tours that they did then through country after arriving in a country and then somehow booking theatres. Like, you can't do that now. You, mm. you couldn't do it for public liability and all those sort of documentary things you've got to do now, working with children and all these I've things. never thought of that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's quite a feat. They just arrived and set up and did show. The, the difference is, is intriguing. But also they were willing to have a life that I wouldn't want, which is continuous touring. What puts you away for, off that idea? I'd like to be at home for some time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, touring's great fun, but it can become a bit wearing when you've been away for, for months. You've travelled to nearly 25 different countries uh, purely for puppets. I mean, what, what was the most enjoyable country to visit <laughs> to do a show? So I, I really enjoyed being in, in Taiwan. That, that was fun. Japan was wonderful. Germany, I liked. I, look, they're all very different and you have wonderful experiences. I enjoyed being in the States uh, and, and Canada. There's not one favourite and not one appalling one. India, for instance, which, which is a very different place to tour in, was fascinating. In uh, and, and that one, that was all, I had a diplomatic passport for that one because it was organised through Foreign Affairs and the Indian Council for Cultural Relations. Uh, so we were travelling most of the time by plane, which was interesting in itself. So back to my qu- previous question about you studying um, and researching the history of, of puppetry. Who now do you think are some significant puppeteers in, hi- in history that people should know about, youth should know about? Well, we have a very important one. I, I've mentioned Edith Murray al- already, but more important probably than Edith was uh, Bill Nicholl, who uh, taught at the um, Melbourne Teachers' College. And Bill had the, the first puppetry guild in Australia, started in a, a little puppet theatre, which he had help from the National Fitness Association uh, to run called The Little Puppet Theatre. His students made very nice marionettes and shadow puppets and rod puppets and he did the insect play which had a live actor on stage with puppets. This is way back in 1950. He started off in the 40s, I think. So he he really did open up the world of puppetry for a lot of people in Australia. As I said, Peter Scriven was involved there. But when Edith Murray was starting Clavelli Puppet Theatre in 1949, I think it is, she knew glove puppets very well, didn't have much knowledge of marionettes and Bill Nicholl lent her sets of marionettes for that and when Peter Scriven did his show in 1953 some of the puppets were from Bill Nicholl's group. So he, he really should be know, uh, people should know more about him. Interestingly when he started the Guild one of the members of the Guild was George Merton who was an Englishman who'd come to Australia before World War II and then joined the Air Force and later became a broadcaster for the Air Force on the ABC. And he went off and started the Ontario Puppets Society in Toronto and was for one year president of the Puppeteers of America. So there are interesting connections there. The other big question I want to ask you is, apart from shadow puppetry, what other form really takes the cake for you? You've seen all these puppets from different cultures all over the world and you, you've become quite an expert on all different forms of puppetry, but which one really, really inspires you or really, you know, really does it for you? I can't answer that uh, satisfactorily because 
I've seen wonderful marionettes. I've seen wonderful glove puppet shows. I've seen shows with large figures. That, no, I don't think I, I'll pick one form. Um, I, when, when I saw Philip Huber's marionettes, I thought, oh, I wish I'd stayed doing marionettes. When I, uh, and when I see Ronnie's show, uh, I think, oh, well, it'd be nice to do some marionettes again. And uh, I remember the beautiful Galatea done by, I think, the Bolshoi Puppet Company, one of the Russian puppet companies, where it was screamingly funny and brilliant work, and I was inspired by the Rod Puppet. One of the shows we did at the Marionette Theatre was the Mysterious Potamus, which I'd seen first at uh, State Central Puppet Theatre in Moscow that was the Bratsovs Theatre. Norman Hetherington was there. This is the for the festival in 1976. Norman was there. Ross Hill was there and I was there. So we all saw this production and I decided to do it at the Marionette Theatre and Norman did the design. Ross made the puppets. They're brilliant puppets. But the funny thing was the puppets in, in the central... In Moscow, had been quite small. They were glove puppets, and when Ross started making these uh, rod puppets for the show, we were using rod puppets, they weren't very big. And I went off for a, a theatre people's tour in China, which was very interesting. It was just after the Gang of Four had been defeated, and so it was still a, a rather old-fashioned China. When I came back, Ross had sort of expanded the scale because he remembered them as being much larger than they were. I was later able to show him a photo later to show that he'd got the scale quite wrong. But we managed with these great puppets. In fact, I'm very glad that we used such big puppets because they did carry well. They looked wonderful on the stage. The giraffe was, I, I think, about four metres off the ground, the top of its head. This, wow. and, and Ross, I can't believe that he was able to do this, was able to have the neck arch over and straighten up just by pulling string. <laughs> I would have thought it was physically impossible and then the head was moving at the top. They were, it was a very nice set. So I don't know how I got into that question. <laughs> Of the shows that you produced with either Clovelly or with the Australian Marionette Theatre, which do you think was your favourite or most successful? Definitely for me, Smiles Away. And the story behind this is, is quite interesting. I had for some years at the Marionette Theatre a brilliant administrator, a young guy, wasn't long out of university when he joined us. He was about 18 years younger than me, Stuart Thompson. And Stuart was excellent to work with and I think I owed a lot of the success that I had in those early years to Stuart. He went off unfortunately for me to the United States and eventually became a Broadway producer. Unfortunately he's died but he was one of the top 50 producers on Broadway and uh, wow. was the executive producer for the Book of Mormon. Oh goodness. And when he died, uh, this is a few years back, the lights of Broadway were dimmed for him. Wow. So he was a great asset. But before he left us, he applied for money for training, for working with different tutors, for, with the puppeteers. Now, one of the great problems with the setup of the Marionette Theatre was that we were rather like a drama company. We would have to plan the show and then you'd have a fixed four or five weeks of rehearsal and then you'd do the show. That's not the best way to do a puppet show. If you take a company like Philippe Chanty, they're working for a year or so, finding and exploring. And we hadn't been able to do that. We did it for us, uh, to a degree with hands in the early part. But now, thanks to Stuart, we were able to create a show over months and the puppeteers throwing in ideas. We didn't have a story to begin with. We had done a TV series, The King of Bunker Wallop, which is based on the Hutt River province, uh, that, that kind of story. Bruce Petty, who was a cartoonist, had designed the, the characters. That was fun to work with and we had this idea that we would do the same kind of setup, a, a king of the outback. And I wanted to try a, an experiment. I, these puppets were large puppets, worked from behind with the puppeteers in view. And not only did I want the puppets to have the advantage that they could speak and the puppeteers couldn't, so the puppeteers were seen to be speaking for the puppeteers, but when they spoke to themselves, they whispered. So you didn't hear their voices normally, you just heard the character voices. 
And I also wanted to see what happened when you got different puppeteers working the same puppet in the show. So the Queen was actually worked by... There were four puppeteers, three blokes and a girl. The Queen was operated at one time by each of those four puppeteers. And the character remained constant, even though the voice changed. That fascinated me. Unreal. Uh, and finally we did... I imposed a story on it about the princess who wouldn't smile because that wasn't in the original idea. But I also was very fond of diprotodons. We'd had one in a play, Captain Lazar. This time I wanted a very large one. A diprotodon is like a prehistoric wombat and I wanted it to be like the pantomime horse, two people inside. And I wanted those two people not to be bent over and carrying a great weight. I wanted them to be standing straight up and carrying not a, not a heavy weight. Ross made a brilliant puppet with thin ribs of plastic and sort of rope over it, and the guy in front, Peter Seaborn, operated the head rather as you would drive a car, <laughs> and they could stay in that costume for hours. They went out into the street <laughs> and walked. To, I remember them walking up the in the drama theatre at one stage, and unfortunately they were shedding <laughs> hair from <laughs> from the diprotodon all the way up. <laughs> so that I, that I think the cleaners would have liked us. Oh, dear. But this diprotodon could go through a narrow doorway. I remember when we first let it out into the rocks in the street, it went through a narrow doorway. It just sort of squashed and came out as a full diprotodon at the other end. There was a nice line in the play where the uh, queen says to the princess, give it an apple, and the princess goes across and gives an apple to the diprotodon and instantly it lifts its tail and it pops out the back and the Queen says, see what happens when you don't, eat, don't chew your food? <laughs> <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. The nice, nicest thing, I think, for me, I've got the review somewhere. Colin Menzies writing in the Sun Herald one week said, the best adult show in town at the moment is a show for kids and it was smiles away. Oh. And Peter Wilson at Spare Parts decided to, to do the show there, and it got very, very good reviews there. I, I didn't see the version. So it was a show that the adults enjoyed as much as kids, and so it is possible without having blue jokes all the way through for an adult audience to enjoy a kid's show as much, and I think that is what I would aim for, to try to do shows that were family shows. Obviously the adults are seeing it in a slightly, from a different viewpoint, but the kids are enjoying the fact that their parents are enjoying it as much as they are. That's very true. Uh, throughout the interview, you've been mentioning a puppet designer uh, no, known as Norman Hetherington. And I think he's a really big name in Australian puppetry and, and puppetry design, but he's not often known. I want to know if you could give us your thoughts on Norman and, and tell us about him, because I think it'd be lovely to hear it from you. Well, Norman was a brilliant cartoonist, there's no doubt of that. He went to Fort Street School and wanted to go off and, and be a cartoonist, and, uh, which really upset the headmaster who felt people going to Fort Street School should follow academic pursuits. And so Norman was never very warmly disposed towards academia <laughs> after that. But he, he studied art at East Sydney and then he joined an entertainment troupe during the Second World War where he did lightning sketch, uh, sketches and also acted. And, uh, so that's the beginning of Mr Scriggle, really. He had made a puppet before that. His father had given him a popular mechanics book from America in the 30s that had how to make puppets out of inner tubes or something like that. <laughs> and Norman had started that, but it really wasn't until 1952 or so, about the time that I started in puppet, that Norman, who was obviously an older, really started doing the puppet seriously. I remember his early work. In fact, the first show I saw at Clavelli Puppet Theatre, Norman was one of the puppeteers. And there you he was go. There, it was a story that Bill Nicholl had used, uh, how the how the moon was made, and uh, Norman was just getting experience working marionettes, and then uh, he made a dissecting skeleton and a contortionist from the book Specialized Puppetry uh, by Wanslaw. Uh, th this is a book that many of the puppeteers know, but Norman's design 
was so much better. Now, at the time, he was working at the cartoonist for the Bulletin. This is in the old days when the Bulletin had a large format and a pink cover and used to have a full page of cartoons by Norman. He did this... Uh, I've got a, a copy of, of Bulletin somewhere <laughs> where he did not only the full page but occasional cartoons throughout the, um, throughout the journal. So he could have gone on and continued as a cartoonist but decided that he liked do, doing the theatrical part, the marionettes. The first play he did was The uh, Reluctant Dragon, which is a, a set play. I've, I've, for the moment, I've forgotten the, the writer, but it, it's a funny play. It's a, it's a St George and the Dragon thing, except that, that both St George and the Dragon write poetry. So the little <laughs> boy who is a friend of both wants them to fight, but they don't want to fight. <laughs> I, I forgot. Uh, they end up, of course, being friends, that's right. This was a lovely show, and... It was the first of the Norman's puppets to blast out smoke like the, the rocket, which is always talcum powder. I mean, the the, the uh, women that worked with Mr Squiggle often used to end up with talcum powder all over them oh, thanks to the rocket. And it wasn't the most expensive talcum powder that he used. Anyway, anyway when that television came... Norman uh, he had a Nicky and Noodle. Nicky was a little boy, Papa and Noodle, a dog. And so he did little bits of that. He was also on a commercial channel, Jolly Jean and His Fun Machine, which was a syndicate from America, which had a cartoon narrator, so he was well equipped to do the cartoons and that. And then Mr Squiggle had appeared... I think it was in the show that I helped Norman do at David Jones uh, in Parramatta years ago. It was just a character that turned up and drew things with the nose. But it took off, as you can see. And, and it really it, it encompasses so much of Norman. I just The character is one side of Norman. Not all of Norman, but it, it, it was an easy character for Norman to work into. The Royal Australian Mint just recently uh, held an exhibition and created a, a, a coin for Mr Squiggle. And I remember growing up with Mr Squiggle as a child and it was the, the sort of my first introduction, apart from Sesame Street, into a puppet, but also into art and how the two really merged together so beautifully. And we had these creatives in the puppet industry that are so multifaceted and have so many different talents. I think Mr Squiggle was a way in which you can see a person's talents being used twofold in a really lovely way that combines the two forms together. I wonder if there's been a show quite like Mr Squiggle. I think that was just something that, and it lasted for years, didn't it? I mean, I was probably getting the tail end of it in the 90s, but... Well, it, it's very different from other sort of puppet things like uh, Muff and the Mule was the first one. That was the Bustles did it in, in Britain. And then there was, uh, it was Howdy Doody, I remember now, Howdy Doody. Um, and they, they were very different from Mr Squiggle, who was extremely polite. Not what you expect from Australian television, actually. He was gentle, polite and considerate. Um, and it's fascinating that this character should take off. Partly, I think, because it involved the audience. You could send a squiggle into the television studio and see your squiggle turned into something like a fish with an umbrella or some, <laughs> some ridiculous idea, usually upside down, because Norman used to draw these things by holding the top of Miss Squiggle's hat, which was a metre away from where he was drawing, and yet he, he got a, a recognisable drawing. He was a little bit worried that people would copy that idea. I think there are very few people that could draw with a pencil a metre away from their hand. Yes. They wouldn't have added the character. I should also mention that Margaret Hetherington, Peggy, uh, his wife, was very important to that series because she wrote scripts for and helped write characters like Gus the Snail. And the, yes. Uh, so they worked together. It was a team effort. What I loved about Mr Squiggle and other puppetry shows in those days is just how, like you said, it, it was able to interact with with children and, and have them really be a part of the show. Your shows are often seen by children. I think a lot of puppeteers mostly perform to children. What have you learnt about children and, and how to entertain children over the years? 
It helped greatly that I had worked with teenagers uh, when I was teaching. And, you know, they're, they're rather an intolerant group. <laughs> and you, you have to win them over by doing something, I think, that you believe in, but also that they they will accept. You mustn't talk down to your audience. You must feel you're with your audience. And even if it's a very young audience, you must be their age and sort of think their way if you possibly can. It's very hard to remember what I was when I was five, but I still think there's something there that, uh, that I can feel. You're listening to Talking Sock. This is Philip Miller. I'm Richard Bradshaw. I'm Sue Wallace. And you are listening to Talking Sock. Talking Sock Podcast. The one orange sock production. This is the number one podcast for puppetry in the country. Your one-stop shop for all things puppetry arts and practitioners. The number one puppetry podcast in Australia. Follow this podcast. Welcome back. You're listening to Talking Sock with Pete Davidson and Richard Bradshaw. And we've been talking about Richard's incredible legacy of puppet magic and his work with the Clavelli Puppet Theatre and the Marionette Theatre of Australia, as well as his incredible work founding Unimar Australia. Richard, I'd like you to now reflect back for me. And looking back through it all, can you identify maybe perhaps the biggest moment that you had in your puppetry career? There have been a few great moments, but I think... The best for me was at a puppet festival in New Orleans at the Tulane University in 1974, which had been a good year for me because uh, it was two years after I'd first taken the new show to the Puppeteers of America and then to Charleville and Sweden and Denmark and France. So, so in 1974, I started off doing shows in Barcelona, then did some shows in Germany, then went across to America and I've told you a little bit about meeting up with Jim Henson and Carol Spinney and so on. And that tour ended at the festival in New Orleans, organised by Nancy Staub, who I'm still in contact with. And at the end of the festival, I was the last show. All the shows beforehand had been critiqued, but my show wasn't critiqued because they were going home straight afterwards. <laughs> and I had an audience behind as well as an audience in front. Oof. So I had Jim Henson, Al Lucard and Jean-Luc Temporel from France. I think Carol Spinney was there, Jane Marshall. There were about a dozen people behind. That's quite a list. And I had an audience of about 600 out front in the theatre. And the show went very well for me. It was a great, great audience. And there was one moment in the show, I have an item that I occasionally do with two large legs on the screen and a sort of beetle thing, it it was a beetle then, it's now a worm, crawls up one of the legs and disappears at the top for quite some time before it reappears at the other side. And in the time that it had disappeared, I just stopped and looked around at our audience behind and shared listening to the audience because gradually there was a little bit of a a titter in the audience and there's the laughter grew and then eventually there was quite a strong laugh when I could go back and have the beetle appear safely without having done anything untoward. <laughs> <laughs> then it gets trodden on, which is very sad. I now have it escaping. After it's trodden on, it revives. It's a worm now. <laughs> In fact, I think they're very worried because it's a worm because they're very happy when it reappears on the outside of the leg. And that's the thing. <laughs> so having that amazing sense of comedy, again, is that timing that you bring to all your shows. Of the stories that you have, which is your favourite? It's the ostrich, the mouse and the hippopotamus. Uh, and as I, I told you earlier, it grew from two items, but somehow it seemed almost as if that item was there before I created it. It it was a a strange feeling that it worked so well to have three creatures doing three things and then to have a surprise ending with the hippo sliding down and squashing the mouse. It didn't get the biggest laugh in Sweden where they said, we're sorry for the mouse, (laughs) which which is a nice thing about the Swedish. (laughs) So nice. So you've 
I mean, we've enjoyed this incredible couple of hours today talking about this legacy of puppetry, but also this community of puppetry um, that was very prevalent in the 70s and 80s in Australia. And I want to ask where you see the industry going here in Australia now and today and what it might need to thrive in the same way it did then. Well, it is very different now. Uh, People can take a show overseas very easily. They fly to the shows. And so a lot of Australian shows have have travelled overseas now. I I was looking at the uh, Atlanta Centre for Puppetry Arts at their website the other day and uh, saw was it New Owner, which is a show from Western Australia that's just been playing there. It's, and they're the people that did Alvin Sputnik, the puppet show. Um, so I think shows are moving round much more. It is probably harder to move them round by aeroplane <laughs> because uh, you've got to make things fit into your suitcase or else send them by freight. It's it's not a, not an easy thing. But I, I, I think I'm very optimistic that puppetry has a future, but it's got to uh, adapt to the technical things that are available, which are video and so on. It's interesting that Frank Newman, when he uh, became artistic director of uh, Terrapin Puppet Theatre, he used quite a lot of video work and clever video work. And that's an interesting thing for puppeteers to try to take on. I still like the simple puppet and I'm amazed what you can do with a simple figure. Richard Bradshaw, we're going to go um, to the book that you have written, Richard's Guide to Shadow Puppets. Can you tell us about how that came about? (laughs) Now, we have to go right back to 1972 when I was about to go from England, where I'd just been visiting after playing at the Puppeteers of America Festival, to Charleville. And I had no idea how I was going to get my puppet from the airport uh, up to Charleville. And two people, Lumen and Arlen Code of Code Canada Puppets, helped me because they had hired a car and they came to all the airport and got the things for me and then we got them freighted. So I became quite friendly with them and they did a very nice show and in 1975 they came to Australia and uh, performed here with their show thanks largely to my promoting them and so they were good friends for a long time and they said will you write a book for us on shadow puppets. I found a letter from them dated 1993 I think which said how's that book coming along? (laughs) Well, it didn't. <laughs> Arlen has died, and uh, but Lumen is still there and publishing books. And so in, I think, 2014, I said, I'm going to do that book. And so I sat down and went through it. I'd, I'd made various attempts early on to do it. It was much better that I had waited. There are things I would, I would change now, but I, I'm pretty happy with what happened. So it is a manual showing the way I work shadow puppets, and there are other ways of working shadow puppets. It also has a little bit of background uh, to how I became a shadow puppeteer. And it's printed on demand, so if people want a copy, they should look up Charlemagne Press online. Lumen Code, he gets it printed uh, in the States, and then it's posted out, so the postage isn't part of the cost. So if people order the book through him, you usually have to use PayPal to pay. Uh, it costs 35 US dollars. Obviously, we want people to buy your book, but what free advice might you have for young puppeteers, particularly shadow puppeteers or performers or builders in Australia, having done so much puppetry yourself? Well, uh, I've said a couple of times, keep it simple. Start off with the, the simple construction and then perhaps work into something more elaborate. Don't do something just because you think it will please the audience. Do something that you would like to see if you were sitting in the audience. So you have to do it for both, for them and for you. You're going to be performing that thing many times and you should be enjoying it. There are still times when I'm doing the ostrich mouse and hippopotamus when I laugh uh, and I'm laughing with the audience, but I'm enjoying the joke still. So, in other words, don't talk down to your audience. The other thing, of course, is to exploit your own talents. If, If it's in making, designing puppets, make sure that design is an important part of the show you're doing and 
don't try to do something that you're not really equipped to do. There are many shows which would be much better if the puppeteers had some acting experience. It is a form of theatre, and I think you have to approach it. It's not a form of design, or it's live theatre, and you have to remember that. Richard, there, once upon a time, there was a TV series called Inside the Actors Studio with James Lipton. He would interview uh, several different actors, very popular actors from Hollywood. And in all of his interviews, he would ask the actors 10 questions, which they had to answer with the first thing that came to their heads. <laughs> it's a series of questions. I think you'll do really well at this. I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind me asking you these 10 questions and give me your first response. Ready? Yes, I don't know how we'll do with this. I think it'll be great. Are you ready? <laughs> Richard Bradshaw, what is your favourite word? I think phloxnihilipilification. What does that mean? It means estimating is worthless. It's a very long word. One more time. Phloxnihilipilification. <laughs> Richard Bradshaw, what is your least favourite word? Trump. <laughs> what turns you on? Good music. What turns you off? Bad music. <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? The sound of a butcher bird is a sound that I like very much. Also the sound of magpies too. What's a sound or noise that you hate? Uh, the chalk on the blackboard. I think that's a favourite nasty sound for lots of people. <laughs> What is your favourite curse word? Poop. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? That's very, very hard, isn't it? Uh, yes, I probably would have enjoyed being a naturalist, but uh, yes. <laughs> what profession would you most not like to do? Dentist. Oh, I just wouldn't want to be looking into people's mouths. I've had enough experience of dentists from the other side <laughs> no, and I feel very sorry for them. <laughs> and if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Not you. <laughs> Richard, we're out of time. Thank you so much for talking with us today. It has been just a wealth of knowledge that you've gifted the Australian listeners, and I'm really grateful and very honoured to have met you today. So thanks for listening with us today and make sure you subscribe for more great puppetry arts and practitioner interviews. I've been Pete Davidson, that puppet guy, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Richard. You're welcome. I've probably left out an awful lot of my life. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Now we want to hear from you. Each week we'll post a series of questions related to every interview. Join the conversation on Twitter at Talking Sockcast. You can help us bring puppet power to the podcasting world by hitting subscribe, liking our socials and telling your friends. Like us on Instagram at One Orange Sock Productions and check out our episode blog at OneOrangeSock.com. You can support our podcast by pledging to us on Patreon. Your support helps fund our audio mastering, interview transcriptions, and much, much more. Find the link in the podcast notes and earn yourself a shout-out on our socials. Head to our website at oneorangetalk.com or talk to us on Twitter to see how you can show your support. Our music is composed by Elizabeth Maniscalco and our cover art is by Chad Vanier. Without them, this podcast wouldn't be possible. We'll be back next week with another great episode here at Talking Sock. 